Hi, welcome to the Rod Chapel Show. We're glad you could join us again. Today we've got a, uh, a guest that I know will share information that you often wondered about and will have a real value in your lives. We have Michael Barrett, who is the general counsel at the Missouri State Public Defender System. Uh, Michael, welcome to our show. Thanks for having me, Rod. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Michael, I, I, I won't spend a, a lot of time on it, but uh, there are a lot of misconceptions, I think, about the uh, public defender system, and I think that a lot of folks want to know more, and so I'm really yeah. happy you took the time to be with us today. Great. It's my pleasure. Can you tell us, what, what's the mission of the organization? Well, Rod, the mission of the organization is to provide legal defense representation in court for indigent Missourians who are accused of a crime or are convicted of a crime. So. If you're charged with an offense in Missouri and you can't afford to hire an attorney, mm -hmm. that's where we come in. Okay, okay. And, and that's only criminal cases, right? It's only criminal cases. Okay, okay. Are there any, uh, and when we say indigent, kind of tell me, you know, many times I feel like I'm indigent, that's right. uh, at least at the end of the month. Uh, what, are there standards? Is there a rubric? Or? There are standards. Oh. Um, you know, the idea is everyone who's charged with an offense should be represented by counsel. Mm -hmm. Um, in reality, we do have a standard, um, and if you have to meet certain poverty standards to qualify. Um, and so you have to file an application to qualify for our services, which I'm guessing you probably um, understand that it, it creates a gap in, um, between those who meet those standards and those who can actually afford to you know, write a check for five or $10,000 retainer for a private attorney. There's a lot of people fall into that gap. Oftentimes, that gap's filled by judges who will appoint us notwithstanding in the case. Oh, is that right? Okay. Okay. And uh, tell us, is, is this based on a constitutional principle or a state law principle? How is it that people are entitled to a defense? Well, the Constitution always provided um, for uh, represent, um, indigent representation um, um, in federal cases. Um, but it wasn't until 1963 in a case called Gideon versus Wainwright um, where that um, right was applied to the states. Um, it was a drifter um, who was incidentally from Missouri, bur buried in Hannibal, Missouri, mm -hmm. um, um, Gideon, who traveled to Florida and was charged with committing a, a burglary. Uh, while he was incarcerated, he, on DOC stationary, prison stationary, he, he penned a, a, um, an appeal and saying that he was, he was deprived of the right to counsel. Um, in the unanimous decision in 1963, uh, the Supreme Court held that, um, that, that indeed, um, that whether it's state or federal court, um, if you are charged with a criminal offense and cannot afford uh, an attorney, the state has an obligation to provide you with one. Incidentally, um, uh, Gideon won not only in the Supreme Court, but when his criminal case was remanded for a new trial um, and he was given representation, uh, he was acquitted of the charges. That's incredible. That's incredible. Uh, I bet you we could spend probably an hour talking about Gideon and the intricacies of it. It's fascinating. It really is. It really is. Uh, t tell us more in terms of the organizational structure for the public defender system. How, how, how are you organized? Is it county by county or yeah. city by city or how yeah. does that work? So it's a little bit different than how um, the, the prosecutors are set up. Mm -hmm. You know, we, every four years uh, the people elect their prosecutor. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have, you know, we have a prosecutor in every county in the state. Um, a little bit different for uh, the public defender system. We have a statewide system um, where, and it wasn't always that way, um, but we have a statewide system where we have a, a single director. Um, the um, Missouri General Assembly provides us with funding and we hire um, the, both lawyer um, employees and uh, non-lawyer employees. We have about 560 employees statewide, 350 of which are attorneys. The rest are um, paralegals and investigators and clerks. Um, and, and that's how we're set, we're set up. We're set up over 33 trial divisions. We wow. have 33 divisions throughout the, um, 33 uh, trial divisions throughout the state. Mm -hmm. We also have a, a capital division and a, an appellate post-conviction uh, division. Okay, and the capital division, uh, they don't just deal with Jeff City. Who, right. what, what do they All do? The, um, they, you know, if, if someone, if the prosecutor is seeking the death penalty in a case, uh. um, they will um, provide representation um, and it's, they do statewide representation. Um, okay, okay, I imagine in Missouri they're pretty busy. They are, unfortunately, um, uh, this past year, um, uh, Missouri executed um, um, more uh, inmates than any other state. I think they were tied with Texas. 
Uh, but it's, uh, to me, it's not a list we want to be on. No, I mean, and you may not know the answer, but how can that be? Texas has got to be triple the size of Missouri. It is, and it's, it's alarming. And, um, you know, we, um, th this past year, I think we've had um, 10 separate executions uh, uh, in 10 um, consecutive months, and we've already had um, one scheduled for uh, 15. So, okay, you know, great. anytime you have criminal justice policy, you want to see... Um, that it's bearing fruit in public safety. Mm -hmm. So the problem is, is that Missouri can't show data to show that um, by giving people a sentence of death, we're seeing uh, benefits in public safety or the crime rate or the murder rate. In fact, we find ourselves in two other lists of dubious distinction, um, the rate at which um, we have violent crime in, in Missouri. Mm -hmm. um, you would think intuitively that with the death penalty and um, that the crime would actually go down, but um, states that have the death penalty actually have a slightly higher murder rate than states that do not have the death penalty. Wow, because doesn't that logic go with the death penalty that if, uh, if we have this penalty, then people will think twice, so to speak, before they go out and commit these heinous crimes? Well, that's definitely the logic, and that's intuitive uh, to think that way, but, Just, but the data work. doesn't bear that out. Right, doesn't work. Right. Doesn't work. Right. Boy. And the other, you know, the other list that we find ourselves on is the rate at which we incarcerate Missourians. Uh, we're eighth um, in the United States at the rate at which we incarcerate our, our citizens. Again, if, um, it'd be one thing if we were showing uh, good results, mm -hmm. good, good crime rate uh, data right. as a result of that, mm -hmm. when the opposite is true. 31 states actually saw a decline um, in crime rate over the last couple of years and a corresponding decline in prison population. Unfortunately, Missouri's uh, seen the opposite. We've had um, um, either the crimes stayed flat or slight increase mm -hmm. and violent crime, particularly in the cities, have, have gone up um, and uh, yet we're, um, we're incarcerating um, more Missourians than the vast majority of other states per 100,000 people. Wow. Wow. And, you know, you may not be able to comment on this, but it seems like we're stuck in a criminal justice system that is at the least antiquated in terms of uh, the practicalities or the policy that it's based on. And it doesn't seem to be um, achieving its objectives either. Yeah. Uh, you know, in fiscal, by um, the Department of Corrections' own annual report, somewhere between fiscal year 2012 and fiscal year 2013, they surpassed their capacity, meaning they ran out of room for housing offenders. Wow. Um, now, um, a new prison would cost $130 million a year. Um, and, and so you could say that, um, that what we're experiencing with those numbers, with those mm -hmm. results, is kind of the hangover from the kind of tough on crime era of the last 35 years. Mm -hmm. you know, the states that have seen that change, that have seen decrease in prison population, decrease in crime rate, mm -hmm. are the states that have moved to a smart on crime approach, adopting policies that um, stem, the side of, stem the tide of the rising uh, prison population. Um, the states that took that leap of faith when they saw um, uh, those early states get better results mm. by locking fewer people up, then they, they took that leap of faith and started investing in alternatives to incarceration. Um, and Missouri, to Missouri's credit, has done a great job of investing in uh, drug treatment courts, mm -hmm. um, um, the now veterans courts mm -hmm. um, for, for um, our veterans returning home who are suffering from PTSD and traumatic brain injury. Right. The, the movement's slowly starting to catch on to um, addressing the issue that's precipitating the criminal conduct instead of just punishing the conduct. Amen. And we're going to come back, and I hope that, uh, do you have time to join us in another sure. segment? be glad to. All right. Well, thank you for joining us today on the Rod Chapel Show. We appreciate your time and attention to such public issues uh, that require some scrutiny. And we look forward to seeing you again on the next episode with Michael Barrett. Hi, I'm Kurt Probst, and I'm a big brother. Missouri Valley Big Brothers Big Sisters desperately needs your help. Right now, more than 50 children are waiting for someone to spend time with them, waiting for a mentor. By spending time with a child, you can change their future and improve their chances of succeeding in life. All it takes is one hour a week. Call Missouri Valley Big Brothers Big Sisters at 634-3290 to get involved today. We are proud to be a United Way partner agency. Hi, welcome back to the Ride Chapel Show. 
Uh, in the last segment, we were talking about the Missouri State Public Defender System with their general counsel, Michael Barrett. Thanks for coming back. I appreciate it. You know, we kind of closed off and we were talking about some policy implications yeah. that are uh, far reaching. Um, th tell me, uh, how would changes in the criminal justice system affect the, or could some changes in the criminal justice system affect the public defender system? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, when you spend um, um, taxpayer dollars, you want to spend them wisely. Mm -hmm. and you want to get, you want to get some results. So every public safety dollar you spend, you have to ask yourself, is this going to get me the best results um, for the safety of the citizens? Mm -hmm. um, and you know, in 2004, I think the, um, we spent the budget for the DOC or prisons was um, $575 million. That's a big hunk of change. But just 10 years later, um, DOC's budget is $677 million. That's $100 million more in just a decade. That's $10 million more a year. Every year. And that ended last year. Yeah. It does, I imagine the projections are just going to go on. One would think. I mean, yeah. there's no reason to think otherwise. Mm -hmm. but th and that may be fine if the results were there. Right. If the crime rate is down, mm -hmm. if people are safer. Yeah. But that's not the case. The, the, list, um, the list that I, Missouri's on that I alluded to in the earlier segment bear that out. Right. So you have to ask yourself, are we spending money in the wisest way, the most strategic way? Mm -hmm. um, um, and, and I would make the argument that we, we do, the Missouri State Public Defender System, through its great attorneys, both trial and appellate, mm -hmm. are, are skilled uh, practitioners, um, right. expert in criminal law mm -hmm. who do a great job. In fact, we do 90,000 cases a year. And wait, wait a minute. In the last segment, I thought you said that you only have 550 people that work for the whole system. And just 350 attorneys who do 90,000 cases a year. I can't break that math down. I don't try. Okay. And here's something else. The economies of scale that we provide by having a statewide system mm -hmm. allow us in our trial division cases, everything from misdemeanors through A felonies, um, to do it for just approximately $345 a case. That's incredible. Yeah. That's so, incredible. So my argument would be um, our attorneys do a great job mm -hmm. not only protecting people's individual rights mm -hmm. and making sure that they receive due process. I would argue that with greater funding, um, their ability to do that will increase, and we can do a better job making sure that, the, that we don't use um, very expensive criminal justice resources on, um, on, on prison when we don't have to. Right. We make sure that if someone goes to prison and uses those resources, mm -hmm. that it's a certainty um, that they received the best legal assistance that they can. Right. They? You know, one of the questions that I get a lot are, uh, you know, I've got a criminal charge, and it might be a misdemeanor or a felony, whether in city court or on the state level. Uh, do I need to get a lawyer? Right. And, and my standard answer is, especially in criminal things, you better get a lawyer. Right. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. You mm -hmm. know, the collateral consequences of having a conviction, whether misdemeanor or felony, right. are, will stay with you for a lifetime. But people it, tell me, go ahead, go ahead. And it affects your ability to get certain licenses, and uh -huh. ability, um, both professional and leisure licenses. It affects your ability to get a job. Uh -huh. um, and those are some of the policies that we need to look at. But it's not just about um, avoiding prison or avoiding local jail. Mm -hmm. It's um, the impact of a criminal conviction on the rest of your life. So that's one reason among many why you should get an attorney. Absolutely. Absolutely. Sometimes, sometimes people tell me, well, you know, I'm, I'm innocent, so I'm just going to go in there and I'm going to tell the judge. Uh, you know, as general counsel for the organization, ha have you seen that be an effective tra strategy? Well, that's a, it's a terrible strategy. <laughs> uh, the judge uh, is a neutral arbiter. Um, the, the prosecutor's job is going to present evidence um, that's typically um, not um, um, very beneficial to the accused. Right. Um, it's the defense attorney's job mm -hmm. to make sure that that evidence that's presented is tested, um, it's confronted, um, and any um, evidence that would exonerate the accused is also presented. Right, right. And that's just something that 
regular folks might not be equipped to do if they, unless they know the rules of civil procedure, or, or well, actually the rules of criminal procedure, right? right. right. Uh, you'd have to know a little bit about trial strategy, right. have some skill at being uh, retaining experts and analyzing evidence. Right. It, it's a whole bucket of experience that you can get either in law school or by practice that most folks don't have. It's an esoteric field, and yeah. uh, you know that's what's so great about our attorneys is they, by statute, um, when we when you're hired with the Missouri State Public Defender, mm -hmm. this is this is the only type of law you can practice. Wow! You can't take other cases, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. you become an expert very quickly um, right. when you're working for us. That's incredible. The uh, and, and now even without looking at the total number of cases, just the fact that you know on average a case costs three hundred and forty-five dollars. Uh, just just so we're clear. That's not what you would expect to pay if you were out in the private marketplace trying to hire a lawyer for your case, right? No, in fact, um, I don't think many um, private criminal practitioners would take a case for that, for that total sum. You're looking at a five or that $10,000 retainer as standard practice. Right, right. So uh, the, the state public defender system actually provides uh, a very, I'm gonna say it's an incredible service, for people of the state by ensuring that they get fair representation when they're being prosecuted by the state. That's right. Because right. without those resources, many of those folks would simply go to jail and we would just fill up our prisons even quicker. Right. I mean, you know, it's the deprivation of liberty. Um, and before you are deprived of your liberty, you should receive due process. And that's what the public defender um, is for, regardless of your ability to, um, um, to pay or, uh, you know, how um, fiscally advantaged you are, mm -hmm. you are going to, you're entitled to all your rights under the Constitution. And it's the Missouri State Public Defender who makes sure that you receive um, um, your constitutional protections. Wow. Well, it's not often that we get to think of a, a public service as a superhero, because uh, anybody that's pretending, pr protecting my constitutional rights is a hero in my book. Well, that's what um, the, the 350 um, assistant public defenders throughout the state of Missouri do every single day. Wow, wow. The, uh, now, I think in the next episode, uh, we're, we're going to talk a little bit about DNA and how that's used, uh, a little bit more about maybe the, the people that, that get represented and some of uh, the things that we've been able to do. Uh, and I say we, because I feel like we, uh, we as Missouri citizens right. are a part of the state public defender system right. and, uh, and need to see ourselves like right. that. Right. Uh, let me actually ask you one more question about sure. funding, though. Uh, from, from the legislative side, I know some, some programs have a special fund where money goes in there and you know that you're going to have you know, X number of dollars to spend per year. Is it that way with the public defender system, or does it, does it vacillate, just depending on what's appropriate? Well, we, the funding has been um, pretty consistent. Unfortunately, um, the governor has um, chosen to withhold funding that's been appropriated to us. Um, and it, sometimes when that's released, it's not released till late in the fiscal year, and um, we'd have to rush to spend it. Mm. Um, right now, $3.4 million uh, that's been appropriated by the legislature um, is being withheld by the governor, and we're, it's our hope that that money is going to get released. Well, we certainly hope so. Great. Thanks for joining us on the Ride Chapel Show. You know, you can find us on Facebook, and there's also a blog related to the Rod Chapel Show. If you have questions, please submit your questions there, or you can call us at 855-977-WORKER. Uh, uh, We'd love to hear any other questions or concerns that you might have, and hope, we hope, that uh, the information presented here is making an impact in your life. Thank you. Hi, I'm Angela Hirsch. And I'm Heidi Lucas. We're with Central Missouri Community Action, a nonprofit organization dedicated to alleviating poverty in mid Missouri through programs like Head Start, Energy Assistance, Section 8 Housing Assistance, and Employment and Training. Our mission is to empower individuals and families to achieve self reliance. We engage the community to address the causes and conditions of poverty through organizing efforts, outreach and education, and community development. Find us online at www.showmeaction.org and like us on Facebook. Join us in ensuring that our community is a thriving, vibrant, and safe place to live for all families. Thanks for joining us on the Ride Chapel Show. It's a pleasure to be with you again. 
And we have the final segment in what has been a great discussion about the Missouri Public Defender System. Michael Baird, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. You're the general counsel there, and we've talked about some, uh, some programmatic issues, some policy issues. Let's talk about the future just a little bit. That's great. Uh, we've got uh, a huge issue that's been, uh, at least in Missouri and around the nation and around the world, in fact, uh, in terms of municipalities and how they interact with their citizenry. Right. Uh, I know that there's some, uh, some issues regarding, uh, regarding that. Let, let me just ask you, what's on your mind related to municipal organization and how uh, they treat their citizenry? Well, you know, when you're crafting uh, criminal justice legislation, you, you, you know, you have an array of punishments to choose from for those convicted. But I, I would argue that in every single case, um, all, all the punishments um, should be tied to public safety. Um, you shouldn't have, um, and sometimes we have prison, we have jail, we have probation, and we have fines, we have fees. Um, but those fines and fees shouldn't exist to fund the operations of government. They should be tied to making, uh, to encouraging appropriate behavior, to disincentivizing uh, inappropriate behavior or criminal conduct. Um, I think what we've seen um, uh, post-Ferguson, certainly the issues preceded uh, Ferguson, is that um, too often uh, municipal governments, um, and, and we see this problem at the state level as well, are um, over-fining, overcharging, um, uh, excessive fees on those who um, are brought before the courts on a criminal charge. Mm -hmm. And I think the result of that is um, um, perhaps um, too often people are burdened excessively with fines and fees and the criminal justice system is supposed to operate so that you move out of the criminal justice system and back into society. Right. But they're so burdensome. Um, and many times, particularly for our clients who uh, don't have the money to, to, uh, to pay for an attorney, sure. are burdened with these fees that they're obligated to pay the court or they're facing j jail time or prison time. And they can never get out of that cycle mm -hmm. of, of um, addressing um, the, um, the punishment of, of the criminal charge. And so what you find is, is someone who's in pretrial um, a local jail and they come out and they owe jail costs. Um, and then they get, um, whether they get a conviction, um, then they still owe those jail costs. And, if they, and what's missing is, before that fine or that fee is imposed, mm -hmm. what should happen is there should be some sort of hearing to make sure that they have the ability to pay. Because, hmm. you know, at least in theory, we got rid of debtors' prisons. Right. We shouldn't punish people for being poor. Um, so we need to distinguish between people who um, owe a debt and can pay a debt but refuse to from those who owe a debt and don't have the ability to pay. Right, right. Because at this point, we're just locking up everybody, right? Well, it certainly seems that way at times. I mean, you could be you know, a, a single mother of three with um, three or four driving infractions mm -hmm. in three or four separate municipalities mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and um, would face um, you know, jail time for your inability to pay. Um, and that's why I say, in theory, we got rid of uh, debtor's prisons because this has become a de facto debtor's prison. Wow. And thankfully, the, um, from the early filings in this, uh, this year's um, General Assembly, mm -hmm. um, so many members are taking this issue seriously and have filed bills to, to, um, to address the issue. That's great. And, and actually, uh, some statewide leaders, I mean, the state auditor. Uh, Seawitch has uh, gone and process. Has he prosecuted? No, he's he's done a an audit right. of several municipalities to determine right. whether or not they're taking in essentially too much money from their fine That's system. Right. That's right. Right. That's uh, and the attorney general's taken on the issue as well. And he's actually prosecuted some, hasn't he? Yeah. 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 Chris Coster. Well, and that's good to see because you would think that as elected officials, they would be concerned with the issues that affect the the populace, right? right. Um, let me ask you. There are also a whole different wave of cases. Uh, some of those relate to like DNA or the use of DNA. Yeah. 
in order to show that someone is guilty or innocent. Does the public defender system have access to those resources or? Well, certainly if there's DNA in a case, we can request that the DNA be tested. You know, DNA is a fascinating thing. We didn't always have the ability to test um, to DNA. Mm -hmm. And um, we see a number of cases where the DNA was not able to be tested at the time of the case, but then years later, we're able to test. I think what we need to see more of in Missouri is what recently in the last year happened in Texas, of all places. Um, a prosecutor has a public, has a um, conviction integrity unit. And there was a gentleman who was uh, convicted of uh, a rape. Um, he was an African-American man who was convicted of raping a, a young white uh, female. And um, years later, he found out he was exonerated. And it was a head scratcher for him because um, he never sought the DNA and the, he didn't hire counsel to seek the DNA. Mm -hmm. But on his own, the prosecutor tested all DNA on all, case, uh, all available DNA in all cases and ended up exonerating him. We need to see more of that. It shouldn't take um, um, mo a motion from defense counsel to test DNA. If there's DNA in a case, it should be tested. Right. Because not only does, uh, does the state get convictions off DNA, mm -hmm. you get exonerations off DNA. And right. so it needs to be available to both sides. Boy, I tell you. Michael Barrett, thank you for the work that you do with the federal, pub I mean, with the public defender system for the state of Missouri. Thank you. Uh, please thank all the attorneys that work for the organization on, on behalf of at least one citizen. And I want to thank you for watching the Rod Chapel Show. Uh, we'll be back again later this month. We'll have another topic that will hit not only near to your heart, but close to your home.